Today's the program committee has brought us an international topic from an area of the world that is one that has kept the attention uh, of everyone, I think, for a number of years, the Middle East. Recent events in Lebanon, including the continuing hostage crisis, keeps this area before all of us and is one of grave concern. Our speaker today brings one very strong viewpoint about local events in that part of the world, and also, I think, will express his hopes and his country's hopes for peace. Harry Natal is Israel's Consul General for the Pacific Northwest. His family immigrated to Israel in 1963. There, he joined the Foreign Service in 1974 as a Soviet analyst. He served as the, his country's first secretary to the embassy in Washington, D.C., and in a job that must have been fascinating but difficult as the counselor for Israel for congressional affairs. In 1985, he returned to Jerusalem as director of the Division of Great Powers, which involved promoting Middle East peace prospects and also improving and normalizing relations with the Soviet Union. He became Consul General for the Pacific Northwest in August of 1988 and is headquartered in San Francisco. He will discuss Israel's peace initiative and its prospects for a success in his speech entitled, The Middle East, A Region in Turmoil. Please help me welcome Mr. Harry Natal. Well, good afternoon. As I look around, I'm trying to find a good and proper introduction how to bring you from this peaceful, serene atmosphere in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, to the very stormy waters of the Middle East. And uh, frankly speaking, I don't have any bombastic introduction. But this is a very important ingredient in trying this afternoon to understand the many complexities involved in the peace process in the Middle East. We may have here a dilemma. On one hand, we are talking all the time about peace process. Uh, I was in the 70s at the United Nations, and the 155 representatives of uh, this uh, Commonwealth of Nations uh, were speaking uh, on peace. And then you pick up the New York Times and you read that there are so many wars in the world. So if everybody speaks about peace, why we are still have so much aggression going on? And then we also have to uh, realize that uh, despite the fact that peace is a desirable goal, uh, its uh, achievement in certain parts of the world is very difficult. And the Middle East is one of them. This is probably the dominant conflict in today's world. It's important because the Middle East has been the traditional cradle of the three major religions. It's important because of its natural resources, oil, and access to oil at reasonable prices. It's important because the superpowers do have vested interest in this part of the world. And it's important because the peoples who are living in the Middle East believe that this is a very important region and they don't want to go anywhere else. And this includes Israel. Now, before we are going to discuss the prospects for peace, I would like to give you a general overview of uh, the major um, reasons underlining the turmoil in the Middle East. And uh, in not necessarily in decreasing order of importance, I will count two different clusters of uh, factors. One has to do uh, with uh, some uh, structural problems. We call them ethnicity, confessionalism, sectarianism, and tribalism. They are the major characteristics of the Middle East, not only now, but uh, in the last uh, centuries. Uh, the Middle East is populated by many ethnic groups, and they are fragmented and divided. Uh, they are Jews and Christians, and they are Muslims. This is also the place uh, uh, where the three major religions uh, were born, and they clashed over the years. The Islam uh, became the conquering religion in the 7th and the 8th century, and they took over. Uh, the rest of, of the other peoples and religions. The, they divide the world in two categories. Um, the world of Islam, which is called Dar al-Islam, and the world of the uh, sword, Dar al-Harb. And uh, the people who are living uh, in the world of Islam are at peace. The ones who live in the other world 
uh, should be uh, subject to war. This war is called a holy war, it's a jihad. And in this uh, category, there is a subcategory which involves the Jews and the Christians, they being the people of the book. And the people of the book are tolerated uh, because they also believe in one God. However, they are tolerated as minorities. Once they become assertive, uh, there is a certain dynamics which is building in, in Islam, uh, which makes uh, the uh, peaceful coexistence extremely difficult. And later I shall come and illustrate this point. Sectarianism uh, refers to subdivisions within, within one religion. Uh, we all know about the big uh, division in Islam between the Sunni and the Shiites. We know about the different Christian denominations. And we also know about certain splits in the uh, Jewish uh, religion, although they are not as strong in the Middle East as they are in other parts of the world. And finally, superimposed on this um, structure, we have a tribal society, a relatively uh, strong tribal society, uh, where people are developing a great deal of loyalty uh, to the tribe, and uh, this is even much more important than the loyalty to the state. In many of these uh, instances, uh, loyalty to the tribe comes first. For example, the Bedouin uh, in uh, Jordan are first and foremost loyal uh, to the family, to the Hashemites, to Hussein. And uh, so are the Takritis uh, in uh, Iraq. They are uh, very, uh, very loyal to Saddam Hussein of Iraq. Uh, you have the Alawis in Syria, about 15%, maybe less, of the Syrian population who have been dominating the Syrian policies in the last uh, uh, 25, 26 years. Now, if we move from these major structural uh, uh, factors uh, to some uh, more recent developments, we find that uh, two ideas captured the imagination of the peoples living in the Middle East. The first idea was the idea of nas the nationalism, uh, the, the rise of uh, the idea of self-determination, to some extent should be attributed uh, to this great country, to President Wilson. Nationalism, and later on, after the Second World War, a very interesting variant of socialism. So we found in the 50s and early 60s an Arab kind of socialism. They are secular ideas. Nationalism on one hand and socialism are secular ideas, and they are supposed to give us a way to modernize the societies of the Middle East. They were rejecting the traditional values uh, which were emanating from the uh, uh, traditional uh, religious uh, um, uh, of the Middle East. However, in this clash between traditionalism and uh, nationalism and socialism, uh, what happened, we were witnessing a fundamentalist backlash. And starting late 60s, early 70s, and increasingly so, we saw the rejection of most of the societies in the Middle East of these ideas of uh, secularism, modernization, and uh, this manifested itself uh, uh, time and again uh, in the rise of a very strong uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalist uh, uh, current in the Arab countries, and I would say also a strong Jewish uh, fundamentalism in Israel. And these were ways to deal with uh, the uh, uh, very difficult uh, uh, um, repercussions of uh, modernization. All of a sudden, the past looked to all of us uh, good and nice and nostalgic. And we were longing for the good old days when harmony was not disrupted by forces of um, modernization. Now, uh, in the last 10 years, maybe a little bit more, uh, the fundamentalism became a dominant factor in the Middle East. Uh, we all know what happened in Iran, uh, but we have very strong uh, fundamentalist undercurrents in uh, states like uh, Egypt, even in a state like Jordan. If you travel today uh, throughout the Arab world, you can see more and more people uh, dressed in the traditional uh, Islamic garb. And this is also a very good way to equalize, uh, to erase the differences between the various classes. If you dress in the traditional garb, 
Uh, I have been in Egypt a couple of years ago, and I talked extensively to uh, Egyptian intellectuals uh, who were increasingly embracing uh, the uh, concepts of uh, of uh, fundamentalism in trying to uh, uh, in trying to cope with the pressures of uh, modernization. Now let's move to another factor which may explain some of the uh, uh, problems in the Middle East, and this is the personality factor. Uh, this is a region with very strong governments. Uh, with very little democratic tradition. If I'm going to tell you that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, well, some people can dismiss it, but this is fact. This is the only democracy in the Middle East uh, since the late 40s where the power is transferred in an orderly fashion from one government to another. The other democracy in the Middle East, Lebanon, uh, went down the drain in 1975 when the civil war uh, erupted in Lebanon. So the governments are dominated by strong leaders, and the style of management is dictatorial. Now, you have to realize that once you are dealing with uh, people with an authoritarian style of management, their fixations, dreams, and ideological obsessions are determining to a great extent the behavior of their respective countries. And the question becomes, can we detect today in the Arab world in the Middle East in general, a new brand of leadership, a leadership which is fully committed to rational thinking and conflict resolution. To the extent that rationality prevails uh, in the Middle East, then Israel will be in a better position uh, to uh, devise a policy which will take a modicum of predictability. Uh, because uh, uh, being surrounded or living in a neighborhood which is uh, characterized by a deep hostility, uh, the Israeli leaders would like very much uh, to be in a position uh, to determine the course of uh, their country, at least for the foreseeable future. So you need some signs that the other side is dedicated completely uh, to a, a rational model. In other words, don't launch a war, because a war is going to uh, hurt the interests of both sides. If Israel believes that Assad of Syria is also a strong supporter of this concept, then Israel and Syria can work together a way of avoiding an acute crisis and a possible deterioration uh, to war. However, the last 41 years are indicative of many instances in which leaders in the Middle East misread, miscalculated uh, each other's intentions. And I must say that with very few exceptions, most of the wars in the Middle East uh, were the outcome of miscalculation. In 1948, the Arab leaders believed that they can easily uh, get rid of the newly born Jewish state. Five regular armies invading the newly declared state of Israel. It's going to be a piece of cake. One week, two weeks, it's going to be over just to wake up and realize that uh, the little Israel with no military tradition was capable to defeat the Arab coalition, and the explanation provided to that was shame. How come such a people was able to defeat us? Something is wrong with us. And we have to erase this stain on our honor. So they moved into increasingly and aggressively into modernization. Uh, they uh, toppled some of the old corrupt regimes. Uh, the most important development came in Egypt, of course, with the deposition of uh, the king. And once the nationalists took over, they fully dedicated themselves uh, to erase the shame of 1948. And then in 56, and again in 67, they lost again. 67, in retrospect, is a turning point in the Middle East. Because up until 67, many of the leaders in the Middle East entertained the idea that it's possible somehow uh, to throw the Jews into the sea. And the rhetoric uh, in the Arab world up until 67 reflected to some extent uh, this, uh, this uh, belief. After 67, uh, uh, the Arab world started debating uh, the root causes of the Arab-Israeli conflict and uh, a new um, element in, among the Arabs uh, emerged, and this uh, faction believed that uh, you cannot, in the short run, get rid of the state of Israel. It's too powerful, it's too strong. And the only way is uh, to uh, recognize the fact of life. 
Uh, it was not so clear in 67 that this uh, uh, trend uh, will become uh, relevant to a policy uh, formulation, but uh, another war in 73 and a great visionary leader in the person of the late President Sadat of Egypt uh, brought uh, the most important and the natural leader of the Arab world, the state of Egypt, uh, to the realization that you have to deal with the fact of life. And you have to deal uh, with this directly. So that was the first Arab leader to realize the psychological dimension of the conflict during 73, 74, 75 discussion between Sadat and the former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. Kissinger used to uh, tell Sadat, well, what about peace in this generation? And Sadat used to say, well, not in my generation. We need at least 25 years to be able to erase all these psychological uh, problems which uh, uh, have built over the years. However, when the time came, less than two years later, Sadat, Sadat found uh, the inner strength to overcome his own skepticism and reservations uh, to, uh, and make the historical trip uh, to Israel, which was uh, reciprocated uh, by Menachem Begin's uh, offer to engage in uh, direct negotiations. This was the only time in the last 41 years when an Arab visionary leader challenged the Israeli government direct face to face. And this was the only time in 41 years when once the Israelis were addressed directly they said everything is on the table. I still remember very vividly the late Moshe Dayan at the time in 77, the foreign minister of Israel coming to our bureau in the foreign ministry and telling us, well, apparently this is going to happen. So that is going to come and we have to uh, raise up to this occasion. What should we do? And then, of course, we were supposed to give him a lot of ideas because this is what, why they hired us. So we started talking after two hours of models. You know, we built models, model A and model B and model C. And since Diane was known to be somebody very impatient uh, to too many uh, people talking at the same time, he said, forget all the models. What we have to do right now is the guy is coming to Jerusalem. We cannot engage in a kind of a bargaining which is characteristic of a Persian bazaar. This is a unique historical opportunity. So my impression is that Israel should give up the whole of Sinai. And this is the guy who only two months earlier said that if Israel has to face a choice, Sharm al-Sheikh without peace or peace without Sharm al-Sheikh, he will take Sharm al-Sheikh without peace. So when the time came and Sadat was in place, um, Moshe Dayan and later on Menachem Begin said, we are not going to bargain over this. We realize that this peace treaty will involve some uh, territorial trade-offs and we should be able to deliver. But Sadat, as I told you, was the last one to address the psychological dimension of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And after Sadat, was killed in 1981, nobody in the Arab world repeated his uh, initiative. Another point which uh, is important to keep in mind when we talk about turmoil in the Middle East is the role of the superpowers in the Middle East. For many years, uh, we used um, to think in terms of a competition between the two superpowers. The Soviets have interests in the Middle East, the Americans have interests in the Middle East, and they clash and compete. Since Gorbachev came to power in 1985, we are talking about a new uh, kind of Soviet foreign policy, a more flexible a so a foreign policy devoid of ideological overtones, a Soviet policy which is trying today to put premium on conflict resolution rather than on fomenting in instability and unrest. The Soviets finally realized that it's a very costly operation uh, to uh, uh, support their clients in their aggressive behavior because they don't control their clients' behavior and once the escalation reaches a certain stage, it gets out of hand, then who is going to pay and foot the bill if not the Soviets? And the Soviets uh, uh, have significant economic problems and they cannot every five, ten years erase the accumulated military debts of the Arab countries. 
Now, wars in the Middle East are very expensive. This is, in some respects, a third world area, but in other respects, it's probably at the cutting edge of military technology. And many of the superpowers and other powers are testing their combat material in the Middle East. So when you lose a plane in the Middle East, you lost a piece of equipment uh, which can cost you at least $50 million with the avionics. So uh, uh, therefore, the superpowers are uh, paying increasingly attention to the economic aspect of, uh, of uh, conflict resolution or waging wars. Now, let's take three possible models and see how the two superpowers are going to behave in a future peace process. Model number one will involve a Soviet-American cooperation and imposing a solution on Israel. I would say that probably if you conduct today a poll among uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the most important Arab leaders, this is what they will consider the ideal model. The two superpowers will get together, they will decide it's time to make peace in the Middle East. Peace can be done only by uh, ordering Israel out of the territories. They will get together, they will summon Israel to the International Peace Conference, some sort of an international tribunal, and tell the Israelis, you have to do this. If not, in sanctions, and we are going to completely isolate you. Is such a um, scenario likely? I doubt it. And I doubt it because despite the decreasing importance of ideology in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union should be also addressed as a superpower, a power with imperialistic ambitions, a power which had a presence in the Middle East which preceded the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And therefore, a superpower is not going to uh, uh, give up <laughs> to clash. The second model is that, and this is a more realistic one, uh, we have to assume that the American-Soviet competition in the Middle East will continue, though in a somewhat modified way, not as a military competition, but a competition between two different uh, 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 models of development. And in this case, uh, we have to assume that if the two superpowers will get involved in the peace process, they will tend to raise artificial obstacles and delay it. The Americans will try to push their agenda and the Soviets will try to push their agenda. When the Americans are sending an envoy to the Middle East, the Soviets are sending an envoy to the Middle East. The Americans are going to the is American clients and the Soviets are going to, the, uh, uh, to their Arab clients. And then they get together just to find out to what extent the other side was uh, uh, successful in convincing uh, its own clients uh, to give up or not. But this is a clear sign of competition and we have to assume that for the foreseeable future, and regardless of Gorbachev's new thinking in foreign policy, this competition uh, will continue. And in my judgment, this is uh, uh, the most likely model. The third one, which is here for the sake of, uh, of raising it as a theoretical possibility, is that the Soviet Union will accept an inferior role uh, to the American role, and they will fully uh, support the current US diplomatic efforts. Well, I don't believe this is going to happen because, uh, as I told you, the Soviet Union is a power with a long imperialistic tradition and is not going to sacrifice interest on the altar of promoting the American interest. However, uh, Gorbachev realizes his uh, vulnerability and therefore, contrary to the previous Soviet uh, uh, foreign uh, ministers and uh, other leaders, they are not willing today to reject. They are not playing the game of saying no. They don't say yet anymore. What they do right now, they consider things. So the Soviets considered the Schultz Initiative in 1988. And the Soviets are considering today the Israeli uh, peace initiative. And the Soviets are talking to the Americans. And they are asking clarifications and counter clarifications to the clarifications earlier provided. And there are many people in the, foreign Soviet, uh, in, in the Soviet foreign ministry uh, making a living writing papers and presenting creative ideas to their American counterparts. So we have to realize that uh, uh, the perestroika may create an unemployment problem in the Soviet Union and definitely in the Soviet foreign ministry. Not to mention the fact that a lot of the Soviet bureaucrats who over the years were raised and educated uh, to support 
100% one side of the conflict, and this is the Arab side. They, ha they found it extremely difficult today uh, to adjust to the new world of perestroika when you have to smile to the other side sometimes. So uh, this brings me to the conclusion that probably for the foreseeable future, we are going to see a Middle East uh, where the superpowers will continue uh, to pursue their separate agendas. And this means they will have separate and conflicting, sometimes conflicting interests. Interest. This, in my judgment, may delay uh, progress in the Middle East. Now, we have also to realize that we live in a world where the ability of the superpowers to affect the behavior of local allies on matters pertaining to essential and vital national interests is declining. I don't have to tell you that Washington may be from time to time exasperated with the behavior of the Israeli government, and so is the Soviet Union. Uh, getting a little bit uh, uh, sick and tired of uh, uh, the behavior of the Syrians or the PLO or the Libyans or the Iraqis, that you try to build relations with uh, one country in the Middle East only to realize that as you try to do this, you get into some trouble with some other country. Let's take again the Soviets. The Soviets are trying to develop a relationship with Iran they signed a big deal uh, worth two billion dollars of equipment, military equipment, and two seconds after this uh, transaction was uh, signed, the Iraqi ambassador made a demarche in Moscow protesting the Soviet policy. And he was telling the Soviets, how come you are doing this? Because remember, we do have a treaty of friendship, which we signed in 1972. Are you going to abandon us in order to promote your friendly relations with um, the Iranians? And if we move from Iran closer to uh, the part of the Middle East in which we live, the Soviets are constantly frustrated by their attempts to bring the Syrians and the PLO together or to bring the Syrians and the Iraqis together, or to bring the Syrians or the Egyptians together, and to bring the Libyans back into uh, the Arab uh, um, normal uh, interaction. And you can uh, look in a similar way, vein, and see uh, the kind of frustrations encountered by uh, the United States of America. If the United States is going to improve dramatically its relation, uh, their relations with Iran, what kind of a signal this is going to be to Saudi Arabia or to Iraq or to the Arab world? So this brings me to the conclusion that the superpowers in the present situation in the Middle East have a declining ability to impact on the behavior of smaller allies. And this means that if the smaller allies are saying this is a matter of national interest, there is very little that can be done in order to change their decisions. In other words, and let's be a little bit more practical, if the Israeli government today says that there is, under no circumstances, Israel is going to sit down and talk to the PLO, the ability of the United States to impact on this Israeli decision is limited. And so is the Soviet ability to impact on the behavior of Damascus, to bring Damascus and the PLO closer. Now, an additional factor which complicates uh, the efforts uh, for peace in the Middle East is the continuous military buildup in the Middle East. Based on uh, figures released by the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency of the State Department, in the last decade, the combined military expenditure of the Arab world was in excess of $675 billion. This is two-thirds of a trillion dollars going into military expenditures. And uh, this is a tremendous amount of money. Try to imagine if only a small fraction of this money would have been dedicated uh, to development. Let's say to the rehabilitation of the Palestinian refugees. This would have been, in my judgment, a better way to defuse this painful, tra tragic situation and to lay the groundwork uh, for a significant peace process. We do estimate that it will take probably close to $2 billion to put an end to this shame called refugee camps. There is no need 41 years after the problem was first created to have refugee camps. 
Two billion dollars today can solve it. What's two billion dollars against 675 billion dollars in military expenditures? Is a drop in the bucket. What you need, it's the will. So, but not only the, 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 the dollar uh, 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 dimension of the military buildup is of concern to us. Uh, we are also very concerned of the fact that uh, the military buildup is moving increasingly into uh, unconventional areas. We are talking here about proliferation of chemical, biological uh, uh, warfare. We are talking about attempts to acquire nuclear capability and their means of delivery, rocketry, and the state-of-the-art military planes. We have in this country, in the Soviet Union, in Europe, uh, the whole um, sector of arms manufacturer taking the Middle East market very seriously. It's the most important market. This may mean in America jobs and people who are employed, but this may bring a lot of, uh, of problems uh, uh, in, 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 in other parts of the world, including the Middle East. However, the, if this military trend will continue, I'm quite concerned that this coupled with the irrationality of some of the leaders and their propensity for miscalculation, that this may be a devastating combination. So we can find ourselves in a very acute crisis which may uh, uh, bring the whole world on the brink of a major catastrophe, given the, fact, uh, given the facts I just outlined to you. The recurrence of terrorism it's a, a form of low intensity warfare, to use a Pentagon uh, notion. Uh, this has been increasingly used in the Middle East as a way of settling accounts and, and, and some of, uh, resolving some of the problems. It became a major operation in the late 70s, early uh, 80s, with the involvement of certain states which are known to be uh, supportive of terrorism. The State Department designates in its annual report to the Congress three states uh, who are in the Middle East as terroristic states, Iran, Libya, and Syria. And there's a question mark uh, with respect to Iraq. Iraq has been officially removed from the list but there are constant discussions between uh, your government and the government of Iraq over certain uh, element, uh, aspects of the Iraqi behavior. Now, if you again take a look at Lebanon, up until 19, uh, early 80s, uh, terrorism was, uh, was uh, widespread in Lebanon, but this uh, uh, assumed uh, uh, a sporadic um, uh, character. These were acts of terrorism committed by individuals. However, in 1981-82, Iran, being in its uh, uh, stage of exporting revolution, uh, dispatched a couple of thousands of uh, revolutionary guards uh, to uh, Lebanon to start organizing the Islamic uh, Republic in Lebanon. They were the Pasdarans, and they came to Damascus. They were immediately isolated from the rest of the population and dispatched directly to Lebanon, where they established the group known to us today as the Hezbollah, the party of God. Of course, they, they capitalized on uh, some uh, local grievances. But in terms of organization and building the terroristic infrastructure, this should be directly attributed to uh, Iran. And as the recent example of the capture of uh, Sheikh Obeid proves it, Iran has a great deal of control over that. But when we talk about Iranian control over faction, terroristic factions in Lebanon, we have to realize that the reality is much more complicated. When Khomeini was alive, Iran spoke basically with one voice. Because Khomeini was so important in the uh, Islamic uh, uh, hierarchy in Iran that he was the final arbiter. He was the one to determine the line. Once he said what he said, this assumed the uh, dimension of a religious ruling, and nobody could contest it. Khomeini is not anymore with us. He left for a better world. And there are another, there, there, there are some factional uh, struggles inside Iran right now. So when you have an event like the capture of Obeid, then you realize that Iran speaks today with more than one voice. You have Rafsanjani the newly uh, um, elected president of Iran, 
who is trying to play a moderate role, at least the conventional wisdom designates him as a moderate. And then we have uh, other people in position of influence, such as the new speaker of the parliament, Majlis, and uh, uh, the, the, the new supreme uh, spiritual leader, who are trying to continue and perpetuate the revolutionary zeal by manipulating the hostage crisis. Similarly to what Khomeini did when he first took American hostages in the late 70s. So this event, which took place only, I believe, four weeks ago, and by now it's not even news anymore. It's not news because we are all fed by the networks, and the networks are making the decision what's news and what's not news. Uh, this event four weeks ago, for a while, uh, surface the whole issue of terrorism. And I believe that there are four ingredients for a successful strategy against the terrorist. And uh, in my judgment, the civilized world, and this is a broad coalition of states, democracies, but not only democracies, should establish a united front. They should not allow the terrorists and their sponsors to drive a wedge between prospective partners in this anti-terroristic coalition. It's very similar to the effort done in the 19th century in order to get rid of the scourge of pirates in the Mediterranean. Even the Americans sent their naval units to get rid of the pirates operating in the Mediterranean in the first half of the 19th century. So this should be a collective effort. Secondly, the nations who have been subject to terrorist attacks have a right to self-defense. And this self-defense includes unconventional methods to deal with unusual situation. You have to come to the point when you are commanding the attention of the other side. And there are many ways to do it. Since we don't have a government in Lebanon which is capable to enforce the law, there is no address today to deal with, uh, with such a situation. Therefore, you have to use unconventional methods. Your country did it in 1986. We did it in the case of Sheikh Obed. The Germans did in the 70s when they rescued their hostages in Somali Mogadishu. The French did it. And we have to continue to do it. The third element of this policy should be that the state supporting the terrorism should not enjoy immunity. Yes, in the last few years, the United States tried to punish Libya. But Libya is not the most important uh, state supporting terrorism. Syria and Iraq are much more important and they are much more influential. After all, the Iranians are providing the ideology and the finances to the Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the Syrians are controlling the territory where the American hostages, among other people, are detained today. And there should be a way to bring these two governments uh, to abandon the policy of terrorism and to show and to join in the collective effort uh, to uh, release the hostages. And we also have to remember, and this is a very important uh, last but not least element, that no concessions to terrorists should be contemplated. But by saying no concessions, we also have to display tactical flexibility in negotiating with them. And I believe the former Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, was right on target in his recent article to the New York Times when he said, that the US policy on this issue should be one of no concession, not no negotiations. Now, against this background, which clearly indicates to you that we are dealing with a very complex situation, which is not easily conducive to a quick fix. It's not, we are not able to go to some sort of an international conference and come up with the magic formula which is going to solve the, the, the problem overnight. Against this background, we have to uh, look now, turn and look uh, to possible elements of conflict resolution because we have to believe in a better future. 
We cannot get resigned to the idea that the Middle East is going to be the only place in the world where uh, rapprochement between nations is impossible, and uh, therefore we are condemned to this perennial aggression. The alternative to the peace process for the peoples living in the Middle East is the vacuum, and the vacuum can generate an awesome war. Therefore, it's the duty of the diplomats uh, to make sure that this is not going to happen. First of all, we have to avoid creating a vacuum, which means that we have to engage in peace efforts. We have to talk about peace prospects. We have uh, to put our heads to come up with creative ideas. We cannot always analyze the Middle East and conclude nothing can be done. We somehow should come up with small solutions, practical solutions, small incremental steps which are going to build a different reality from the one today. What we need in the Middle East in order to be successful is what somebody calls um, the ripening period. The, the, the conditions should be ripe uh, for uh, the peace process to be successful, which means that you need two partners and you need to agree on what we are going to discuss. Here, we have to ask ourselves three questions. What's on the table? And of course, the answer should be peace and security for everybody, including Israel, and including the Palestinians. Two, with whom do we negotiate? From our perspective, the PLO is not eligible in light of their intransigent attitudes vis-a-vis -vis Israel. I realize that the United States concluded in December of last year that the PLO fulfilled the three conditions posed by the US government back in 1975, and therefore the PLO is eligible for participation in the peace process. Since December of 1988 until now, there were four formal rounds of discussions in Tunisia between the American ambassador Pelletro and the PLO delegation, which incidentally is led by a guy who was involved in a terroristic incident in 1973, which uh, uh, ended uh, in the killing of the American ambassador in Khartoum. Uh, 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 so um, these negotiations uh, did not produce any results. Only two weeks ago, the Fatah organization, which is considered by many people to be uh, the moderate faction of the PLO, and this is the organization which is uh, headed by Yasser Arafat and Abu Iyad and uh, Farouk Kadumi, uh, they uh, went into a conference and uh, they adopted a political program. Now, this political program, in my judgment, was a setback. If you want to be fair, you have to say, well, Maybe it's not different from the setbacks in, inflicted on the peace process by other partners in this. But however, when the Likud Central Committee went into conference in July, everybody was uh, uh, shouting, you are killing your own initiative. And many people uh, did editorials in the major papers. I'm not aware of editorials uh, in some of the papers in the Pacific Northwest on the uh, ramifications of the Fatah Central Committee political program. Let me give you just six elements which show why the Fatah uh, uh, rhetoric uh, makes uh, extremely difficult for the Israelis uh, to consider uh, 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 PLO participation in the peace process. This document, which has been approved on August 14, as the political program, talks about 1948 as the year in which the injustice of partitioning Palestine and the establishment of the Zionist entity occurred. Well, this is the old rhetoric of the Palestinian Charter. Secondly, they talked about the right to implement the right of return and to establish a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital. Now, you have to realize, from the psychological viewpoint, when you talk about the right of return, you send a very powerful message to the Israelis. You are telling the Israelis your statehood is going to be just an episode in the history of the Middle East. Because the right of return means the Palestinians and the refugees who left in 1948 are going to go back. And they're going to go back not to the West Bank and Gaza Strip, they're going to go back to the pre-67 Israel. So as long as you talk about the right of return, you are telling the Israelis, 
forget about your independence. It's not going to work. Thirdly, the Fatah political program talks about intensification and escalation of armed action and all forms of struggle in order to eliminate, I quote, the Zionist Israeli occupation of occupied Palestinian land. This is peaceful rhetoric. They are also talking about escalating the violent disturbances in the territories. Again, I have to ask myself, how many Palestinians should die before a Palestinian responsible leadership is going to come in place and turn to political ways of struggle rather than violent ways of struggle? They are also rejecting the Israeli peace initiative uh, because they believe that uh, Israel insists on unacceptable terms for holding elections. And, and this is very interesting, they decided to establish a special committee to prevent Jewish immigration to Israel. Well, this is just one example why the PLO, in our judgment, is not eligible for participation. I don't talk about the fact that they continue uh, to send their people inside Israel, and there is today widespread terrorism directed against Israeli civilians. And they don't distinguish between people who belong to the Israeli peace camp and people who do not belong to the Israeli peace camp. And some of the recent uh, uh, um, people killed were members of the Israeli peace camp. So what we need is to find Palestinians willing to sit down and talk peace and not the realization of ultimate dreams. We believe that these Palestinians are living today in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They definitely don't want to live under Israeli occupation. The Israeli society is in the process of vigorously debating this point. But in order to take the necessary risks for, the, uh, for making peace, what you need is somebody who talks to you directly. The PLO talks to everybody, to the French, to the Americans, to the Russians, but not to the Israelis. So, in our judgment, the only way to get out of this vicious circle of violence is definitely to uh, launch a peace process. In the full realization that what you have in the Middle East, it's not a civil rights uh, disobedience movement, but it's a strong, historical, sometimes religious conflict, which is deeply embedded in this uh, terrible uh, uh, um, situation in the Middle East. You have to address this problem as an open-ended process. You cannot moralize to one side. You, then you are not supposed to dehumanize the state of Israel, as we are not supposed to dehumanize the Palestinians. We have to think in terms of therapy. It will take a long time, but we have to start it. Because if we don't start it now, maybe history is going to tell us that we missed another opportunity. And let me end up on this note. The Palestinians and Arabs and Israelis are facing today a wind of opportunity. It was, in my judgment, a great opening back in April and May. It closed down a little bit in recent weeks, but it's still there. We have to come down to earth, and we have to face a tough choice, and this is the choice between all or nothing. If you opt for all, you end up with nothing. The Palestinian history is one of always looking for all and ending up with nothing. And therefore, it's time to look for what's possible. And it's time to realize that history does not repeat itself. And definitely, you cannot turn back the wheel of history to 47, 48. Israel is not going to accept it. And I doubt if the superpowers will be in a position to impose such a solution. Peace is possible if courageous leaders are going to emerge in the Palestinian camp, in the Israeli camp, and they will get the support from other uh, countries, including the United States of America. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Natal. The first question will be asked by Jim Van Dyne. Mr. Natal, you alluded to the fact that uh, because of uh, significant pressures on both superpowers, that the reasons for their presence uh, and the development of client states in the Middle East is declining. You also alluded to the fact that our ability to influence Israel as a client state is on the decline as well. Certainly there are strong moral arguments for our continued support of the state of Israel, but is it truly in the self-interest of this government and this nation to continue its support of Israel at its current levels in the face of these two uh, assumptions? Well, you realize that you know my answer to your question, uh, it will be a very partisan kind of an answer. From my perspective, I believe that it's extremely important for the United States and Israel to work in concert. In other words, uh, the United States is in the position to provide a safety net to Israel. If Israel is one day requested to take the necessary risks in order to promote the peace process, it should be confident and strong. And the United States is in a position to provide these elements of confidence and strength. If the United States is going to remove the safety net, then I don't believe that the peace process is going to be possible because it's going to send a different kind of a signal to the other states in the region. It's going to encourage the states in the region uh, which are opposed to the state of Israel to say, listen, there is no need for us to make concessions. Israel is completely isolated. Even the Americans are abandoning Israel. If this is going to happen, this will be a very sad day in the history of the Middle East. We have time for a couple quick questions. No brave people out there. Well, I'll ask one. Come on up. I have a kind of a question. Uh, you spoke of peace in small increments or small things. Uh, I'd like to invite you to a small increment at the First Congregational Church. It's an art show with 24 Palestinian and Israeli artists called It's Possible. And I'd like to invite you to come and look at a small increment in the peace process. Thank you for your invitation. I believe uh, this exhibit was already in, in San Francisco, and I, I visited the exhibit. In view of the uh, Palestinian situation, if they agreed to come to the table with Israel, uh, would Israel be willing to give the Palestinians a state of their own to try and solve the problem? At this point, uh, at this stage in the conflict, in, in the peace process, uh, I don't believe it will be uh, useful to talk uh, the specific uh, formulas of uh, what should be the final disposition of the territories. The Israeli peace initiative is based on a gradual approach. It will start with some confidence building measures. It will go into interim arrangements where the Palestinians living in the territories are going to assume increased responsibility for their uh, lives. And only then, after the two sides will be fully convinced that they, they are capable to peacefully coexist. The discussion of the options, including this option, uh, will come uh, uh, on the table. If you start today uh, with uh, an attempt to define uh, the contour of a, of a final disposition of the territories, you, you kill the whole process. Because politically in Israel today, there is no government which is going to say, we accept the Palestinian state. I doubt if the Palestinians are going to be uh, pleased with a small uh, state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. I don't know if it's viable politically, economically, strategically. I don't know if it's going to solve the problem of the Palestinian refugees. Where the 2.5 million refugees refugees are going to, uh, to leave, or they are supposed to go back to the pre-67 Israel. So rather than talking you know, in, in terms of slogans, Palestinian state, international peace conference, let's address what's feasible at this point. In my judgment, if we are becoming confident that we are capable to peacefully coexist, the whole notion of territories and borders and statehood is going to be under review, and maybe uh, in five, six, seven years, I don't commit myself to any of that, uh, the, few, the, the next uh, people who are going to engage in this peace process are going to say, listen, we can afford to do certain things which were out of question. Remember my story about Moshe Dayan. When Sadat came, he forgot what he said two months earlier. So this is possible only if you are going beyond a certain point. First, it's important to reach the point of no return in terms of conflict resolution. 
when you reach this point of no return and you are fully dedicated and committed to that, then you can start talking in specific terms. We are out of time. I'd like to thank Mr. Natal for taking the time to visit us from San Francisco, and I hope that you will all come back next week for Congressman DeFazio. We are adjourned. <laughs>